any thoughts or any questions on what we've been discussing so far? Because I know that all of you are ministering at some capacity. So uh, if you have any questions, Uh, the, okay, things are clear. That's that's what we feel. Okay, that's that's fine. Then we will. Okay, all right. Let's let's go ahead. Yeah. So uh, as I told you, the next section is more about the love of God uh, and the demonstration of the love of God through our lives. Uh, so we will talk about it. We have touched on it earlier as well. But you know, this is a little more in depth and a little more uh, in detail. So we will have a look at it. So we are starting from uh, verse 9, uh, where we are told that this is uh, love of God. The love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, okay, that we might live through him. So. Uh, the nature of God is revealed through what God has done. But what did God do? We are told here that He sent His only begotten Son into the world. So God the Father demonstrated his love it says this love of god was manifested it was shown to us now god has done many things to demonstrate his love but we would like to call this the grand gesture of love okay so the greatest uh, demonstration of love you know, the 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 pinnacle so to speak of uh, the the if if we want to understand Right, what God's love for us is that Jesus being sent to the earth for us is God's greatest gesture, grandest gesture of love. So the love of God was manifested or shown to us when God, and it says here, his only son, the only begotten son, because there are sons and daughters of God by uh, you know the redeeming work of Christ Jesus we know that he has won many sons and daughters and uh, brought them into the kingdom of God but you know, they are not begotten of the father there is only one son who is begotten of the father and we read about this in Hebrews he's the express image of the father he's the radiance he's the glory of the father he's the perfect reference representation of the father because he's the begotten of the father you know when there's a father and a, a child the child uh, you know in many ways reveals maybe the father's nature or the way the father appears but it's come from the the that that same substance that the father is made of right so you have people say that oh he's just like his dad or uh, you know she's just like her dad that same substance so in this case the begotten or the same substance that the father is made out of you know the nature of jesus right reflected and represented that uh, nature as well so he is the only begotten son who came into the world. Now, this also is very beautiful because this world, which is uh, corrupted by sin, which is uh, infested by sin, why would God want to send his only begotten son? It's an act of love. You see, that's what we said. The love of God was manifested. God had to make a choice like that to send his precious son to this world he must have had a reason why he took such a big decision. 
What is that reason? The love of God. Okay, so the way God loves mankind, the way He loves His create His uh, creation, that is man, that we might live through Him. And what does that love result in? Life. Life through God. So. Is God a good God? We often say that, right? We say, oh, God is a good God. And we sing that song, you are a good, good father. This verse is a very beautiful verse. It says, why did God even do that? So that we might live. Through him, we might live. Right? So in all our uh, life circumstances, and in every season of our lives, if at all we have a doubt in our hearts and we are wondering, God, do you really care for me? Do you um, really want to see me do well? Do you really want to see me uh, prosper and fulfill your purpose in my life? Or are you bringing destruction into my life? You know, the answer is very clear because God's love is such that he gave his only begotten son. He sent him into this world. And we also know the reason he did that is so you and I might live. You remember what Jesus said that you might have life. And have it in abundance. I have come that you might might have life and have it in abundance. Because I live, you shall live also. And uh, we we've seen this as we're studying the book of Acts. The one of the descriptions that Peter used to describe Jesus, the Prince of Life. So God has come, so you and I might have life. So what what does that show us? It shows us, uh, you know, that. That he's there to, to protect us. He's there to care for us. He's there to give us hope. He's there to give us a future. So uh, it's, it's incredible to know that that's what love can do for us. To give us a hope. To give us a life. That we might live through him. Through him, we should have a life right? here on earth. So that is the, the love of God. And how was it manifested? How was it uh, shown to the world? By sending God's only begotten Son into the world. Okay. Just that one verse, you know, you can talk about it uh, for day and night. And it says, in this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Again, uh, the initiation of love happens from God. Or in other words, he is the source of love. And he is the one who takes the first step to love us. If you look at uh, the book of Romans, Romans 5 verse 8, beautiful scripture. It says that uh, uh, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No, while we did not have a willingness to live a life that is pleasing to God, while we were rebels, while we were living in our own ways. You know, Isaiah talks about it. We like sheep have gone astray, each one uh, you know, going his own way. And yet, the Lamb of God was slain for us. Before we had the understanding that God loved us, so that's what this verse says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So he is the one who has initiated that love for us. So what do we do? We've seen this earlier as well. The responding response. It starts with him. So we do it. He is. So we. So John is going on uh, in, in that same rhythm here. And, and he says, because he first loved us, we respond with love. And he sent his son into this world. And he talks about the purpose with which the son was sent into this world. We are told that he would be a propitiation. Propitiation, that word, uh, is, uh, is basically paying the price. Okay. So, uh, a ransom. A ransom for our sins. And that's the reason the son was sent. I mean, can you think about it? What would have gone on in the father's heart 
um, that he had to make a decision to send his son, his only begotten son, his best representation, to pay the price, to become a sacrifice, to be the Lamb of God who will be slain. He was already slain in God's mind, but to actually go through that pain of, of you know, betrayal, of, of uh, being hurt by the ones he loved, and then finally being crucified on the cross. Why should the father make such a decision? And we are told here, God loved us in such a way that he sent his son with the purpose. What is that purpose? Propitiation for our sins. So the purpose is our redemption. Okay, and that reveals the love of the Father for us. And in this way, he's encouraging the believers. And he's saying, can you understand what a great love this is? What a sacrificial love this is. What a powerful love this is. What a compassion. What a kind love this is. And because God has loved us in this way, he's calling for a response. And he's saying, we also ought to. That term ought to, um, uh, in English, when we say ought to, it's, it's like you have to. You have to brush your teeth. Okay? You have to wake up. Uh, because your classes are starting. There's no option there. You have to. So John is saying, when we understand that God loved us sacrificially, unconditionally. Okay. So God's love, uh, we, we see that we say God kind of love. The Greek word is agape. And agape is an unconditional love. It's an eternal, you know, it, it's, a, it's a steady, secure love. A forgiving, redeeming love. So you can talk about the facets of the love of God itself, right? And it would uh, take forever to discuss that. But the God kind of love, He loved us with that kind of a love. And when we understand how He loved us, John seems to think that it will make it easier for us to love others with a similar approach. Okay? So the kind of love that God Give to us, he's selling. You have to, you must, you ought to love one another. What is the reason? If God so loved us, you know, we must also love one another. So now he's talking about the demonstration of that love of God. God has loved us, so let us also do that for each other. And then he says. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. Okay? So no one has seen God. Is that true? We would argue and say, there is, uh, uh, there is a, um, uh, like a theological term. I think uh, it's called uh, epiphany. epiphany. Uh, there's also another term. Let me just look here. Okay, I don't seem to have that here in my notes. Uh, but yes, Epiphany is when you know you have times uh, when God encountered man in a uh, in a form or or you know something finite uh, that that man could see. Time when Jacob. He saw, uh, he saw God encounter him and wrestling with him. And similarly, Moses, right? Moses also had this, uh, this experience. So when these things happen, did God, did people really see God? Because here John is saying no one has seen God at any time. Well, see, it could have been a form and just a glimpse of God, but that doesn't mean that people have seen God. In fact, Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he uses a description of God in which one of the words that he says, this is in 1 Timothy 1, 17, he says, immortal, invisible God, invisible God. So, you know, we have not fully grasped who God is. 
He is immense. Uh, he is infinite. He is greater than what our minds can take and our eyes can see. So nobody has seen God, but how do we know that this God is living in our midst? Tom gives us a key here, and this is a practical key. This must be a demonstration uh, in and through our lives. He says, if we love one another, because God loved us in this way, let us also, we must love one another. And he says, we have not seen God. But you know, it's like saying, have you seen the, the wind? Can you see it? In science, usually when you start talking about uh, uh, you know some matter, they will say, okay, the oxygen, it is an odorless, colorless, uh, you know, uh, colorless gas, unless it has a color, some other gas. Okay, it is, it is an, uh, it, it has this odor or it has that color. So you can describe it by what you see. But here, God, we can't see Him, invisible God. But similar to, to let's say wind, okay, I'm just saying wind. Uh, we can see the effects of the wind. Right? You can see the trees moving, you can feel the breeze uh, touching your skin. So you, you feel it, feel it, and you see the effects of it. So in the same way, how do we tell if God is living in our midst? He's calling the believers to a uh, love-filled koinonia or community. Do a, do a life which is filled with love for each other. Okay, So when we do that, when there is love in the midst of believers, there is love in the church, there is love in uh, fellowship of believers, he says, God abides in us. So, you know, the wind moving the trees, it's like that. Is God really there in our midst? Is love there in our midst? If love is there, huh, yes, God is there in our midst. And his love has been perfected in us, it says. Okay, so when we love one another, so what is love has been perfected in us? Does it mean that, uh, uh, you know, we are loving in a perfect way? Not necessarily, because I know that, you know, we do fall short uh, from from time to time. But, but the word there in the Greek is stelio. Telio has to do more with maturity and completion. So loving in a mature way, loving in a complete way is the perfect love that he's talking about. Not necessarily, oh yeah, it's perfect. The way you're loving your brothers and sisters is perfect. No, that perfect term may not be the right term there. But Telio refers more to mature, you're loving them maturely, right? speaking the truth in love guiding them into uh, uh, you know more of god and being edified for god being strengthened for god fulfilling their purpose for god knowing more of god so it's leading them into those things the love that we shower upon our brothers and sisters so he's saying look if there is love in our midst it shows that god is there okay so there should be you must love one another he says, by this we know that we abide in him or that we are living with God. Remember the theme of John even earlier uh, in, in the uh, first two chapters was abide, right? Abide or live, live in God or stay with God. Uh, and he says, we know that uh, you know God is with us and he is in us because he has given us the spirit. So that is a known fact. You know? uh, this, this is like, um, it, it's a fact that when the Holy Spirit is in us, God is with us. Right? That's easy to understand. And we've also seen, he says, and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. And we've discussed this before. And whoever confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So there is a, uh, you don't find like the train of thought very clear. You know, he's kind of touching upon uh, old things that he has already mentioned. He just now said uh, Jesus as a propitiation for our sins, the Father sent his only begotten Son. 
He's sort of repeating that and he's saying that we have seen and testified. Remember John chapter 1, John chapter 1, we have seen, we have heard, right? Uh, so we have known. So he's bringing that up once again. And he's saying, look, we have seen Jesus. Now we have seen and we testify that the Father is the one who has sent the Son, who is a savior to the world. And now he talks about the right spirit. Earlier he talked about the wrong spirit. And he says, whoever confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God. Earlier, we were discussing about the humanity of Christ, that the spirit of Antichrist, uh, and particularly in, in the time of John, when he was referring to the false prophets, they were saying that Jesus was not at all human. But right now, he's saying that whoever confesses, excuse me, <coughs> that Jesus is the Son of God, so the deity of Christ, whoever confesses, God lives in him. So how can we know God lives in, in our midst? One is, he has already given us the Holy Spirit and we know that he lives in our midst. Another point is when we love one another. Okay. And third uh, point here is he says when we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he in God. That, that you know we are abiding we are abiding in God moving forward now it was 16 and we have known and believed the love that God has for us God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him so now he's talking about this this um, uh, integrity okay uh it's it's really beautiful. It's like uh, uh, if you take a cloth, right? It's a white cloth, and you have blue ink in a bowl, and you kind of mix it with water, and it's nice and blue. You take that cloth, okay? You put it into that ink there, and you bring that cloth out. You would see that the ink is in the cloth right and the cloth is in the ink okay so there is a oneness it's just that that whole mixing together that has happened but if you were to tear the cloth any any corner of the cloth you know all the threads would be blue you can't change that because the ink has gone into it and the cloth has gone into the ink right they kind of become one and there's that that oneness uh, that has come about and he's saying that look, uh, when we live with God, right? When we live with God, He abides with us. We abide, uh, you know, in Him. And we kind of become one with God, and we demonstrate that through our lives, right? So we love uh, our brothers and sisters, and uh, we also confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And by that, we know that we are living with God, and God is living with us. And we have understood, basically he's saying, look, we've understood this great love of God. He says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So we've understood the depth of that love of God. Remember earlier in chapter 3, I told you when we started 1 John 3, oh, what, what manner of love the Father has, has given up to us that we might be called the sons of God, that we might be called the children of God. So that great love which God has given to us he say we have known okay known would mean like a deep sense of understanding it's not just you know reading oh I, yeah we finished one john it talks about the love of god so we have the knowledge of the love of god but is it what john is talking about he says we have known we have experienced we have understood and thereby we have believed so it's it's a deeper way of uh, uh you know touching feeling taking in receiving accepting the love of god and he's saying that what a great love this is that god has sacrificially sent his son to make a way for us and we have understood this love and he makes a beautiful statement about the nature of God here. And he says, God 
is love. Okay, so God is agape. Now, when we use the term love, there's a lot of misunderstanding because of the understanding that people have about love. Right? There are several Greek words used to describe this word love. There is uh, um, storge, right? there is uh, uh, philios, there is um, eros. These are words that, that we use to describe love. But agape is the God kind of love. The other loves have to do with you know relationships, a parental love, uh, a love between uh, uh, you know brothers, brothers. Then eros is the sexual love, like, right? That you have between a husband and a wife. But here he says, God is agape. That's the greatest, greatest uh, form of love we could ever. Uh, receive, right? Uh, and it is unconditional. And the description of the agape love is uh, 1 Corinthians 13. The description of the agape love is Jesus hanging on the cross for us. Not that we deserved, but God loved us. But he first, we love because he first loved us. Right? So he says God is love. God is agape. Now, what if we say Love is God. Okay, would it be the same thing? What is your uh, uh, perspective on that? God is love. Love is God. Is it the same thing? The same thing. God is love. It is the same thing or not? Not the same thing. Not the same thing. Not the same thing. Okay, okay. Thomas is saying it's not the same thing. Dave is saying it's not the same thing. Okay. So, uh, could you explain why it's not the same thing? Uh, according to Bible, God is a love. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the world says that love is God. It's, uh, it's a two different meaning. When people say if you love, um, in the love, uh, love, uh, how can uh, I don't know how to uh, explain it, but um, love is a person. That person name is Jesus. He manifested in Bible says as it even though we were sinners, he demonstrated the love of love on the cross of Calvary. So he is the love. Love is the person, but the world defines opposite. They say uh, love is God, but the, uh, we cannot accept as a believers. Yes, yes, uh, Thomas. Thank you for sharing that uh, view. Dave, uh, why do you say it's not the same thing? It's uh, yeah. The, the first, the meaning is totally different. Mm. Of course, uh, God, uh, God is love. His character is love. He, uh, he loves uh, what what he has created. He loves us. But love. Uh, is um, an emotion and love cannot can never be God it's just an emotion that we feel and and yeah and our feelings uh, can't be our God that's what I feel yeah thank you thank you Dave thank you for sharing your view on that so that's true you know, God is love uh, but the converse love is God it's not the same thing because you see, God is love, and we could take love as one of those very foundational, um, uh, you know, parts of the nature of God. But that's not all, you know, that that God is made up of. God is truth. God is justice. God is righteousness. God is powerful. You could describe Him in, in so many, uh, you know, different ways. God is love, and just to say that love, only love is God, uh, might be misleading. And I also shared with us that in English, we're using only one word, love. But the understanding which people have is varied. So are we talking about the agape, unconditional love of God, uh, being God uh, himself? Well. That might not be what people actually mean when they say love is 
God. Right? They might just mean the relational love that uh, they have for one another. And obviously, you know, that cannot be complete in itself. Right? We need the, the love of God uh, to, to flow through us, to demonstrate his love for one another. So, uh, yeah, for all these reasons, these two statements are not the same. God is love is not equal to love is God. Okay? But it's beautiful to know that God is love and he who abides in love. So far, we've talked about the one who lives with God, right? abide with God, the fellowship with the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But now, abide or live in love. Okay, uh, And that also uh, shows that we are with God and God is with us. So us living in love. So what does this living in love look like? Okay. So we're talking so much about uh, uh, love one. You must love one another. Uh, we love because he loved us and live in love. How does it, that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't uh, correct uh, things that are wrong. Because if you say something, people might, you know, uh, take it in the wrong way uh, or uh, how, how does it work? It's, it's, is it only about being kind it's, is it only about you know saying nice things or let me put it that way being kind is okay but saying nice things that don't hurt people ever okay, what does it abide in love how to love one another? What what kind of a love is that? Okay. You see, again, we can just go back and reflect on First Corinthians thirteen. It says, right, like it rejoices in the truth. It is not boastful. It does not envy. So. Basically, this love, which is from God, will build us up towards God. That's the true nature of love. So when we, uh, when love abides in us and we abide in that love, right, and God is living in our midst, uh, it will show as our obedience to God. It will show as, you know, us building up other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, it might be through a kind word or it might also be through a rebuke when you are mentoring someone. But just because you are uh, correcting that person to bring them on the right track, it doesn't mean that you don't love that person. Right? So love will build up the person. Love will bring growth. Love will bring uh, you know maturity in the people. Whom we love. Love will not uh, sort of cripple people, make them dependent on us. That is not love. That is control. That's not love. What does true love do? True love builds up the other person. True love strengthens the other person. True love uh, you know, brings that person to a place where they are they are strong and they can be they can uh, you know, fully live the life which God has called them to live. So there is liberty, right? There is freedom in the God kind of love when we love people uh, with that love. And that's the kind of love that uh, John is describing here. And he says uh, that, you know, God is love. You, you live in love, right? And let God live with you. And you extend this kind of love to your brothers and sisters. And he also adds now in verse 17, he says, uh, love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Okay, uh, as he was in this world, so as he was, as he is, so we are in this world. Okay, So uh, basically he says that uh, this love, right, the perfection of this love, uh, or first of all, we, we uh, love completely. 
our brothers and sisters. And now he says that this love, its maturity will also be seen at the um, day of judgment. Because when we stand there in God's presence, we will stand acquitted. We will stand uh, delivered right, from the punishment that we have to take. So there is a boldness in the day of judgment because of what Christ Jesus has already done for us. Remember he talked about Jesus being the propitiation of our sins. So we can have boldness because of this love, this redeeming love that God has extended to us, even on the day of judgment, which uh, probably is like a scary thought for a lot of people. But if, we, if you are a believer, since I am a believer, I can have boldness in that day, knowing that God has loved me in this way. He has paid uh, for my sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, And I stand confident. And he also adds, he says, because as he is, so are we in this world. So once again, he says that, you know, whatever God is and the Lord Jesus was that same uh, sacrificial love that we saw in the Lord Jesus. You know, we can demonstrate that to the world today through our life. So who's there in the world right now? Who's there in the world? Where is Jesus? Okay, where is the Lord Jesus right now? The heaven interceding for us. Correct, correct. So uh, the ministry of Jesus has changed in that he is now uh, interceding for us in the presence of the Father. But now, who is in the world? We are here. Holy, the Holy, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Spirit. Correct. Holy Spirit is there in the world with us. But we are being told that we are here in the world too and we are supposed to represent jesus as he is or as his nature is so should be our nature here on the earth and he's talking about all this in the context of love when we live in love when we labor in love you know i always think of uh, uh, when i was uh, 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 just a, like a volunteer uh, in church without involving too much in you know ministry at some point in my life i used to look at pastors and i used to always think every sunday uh, you know i want that motivation from god's word you have your personal walk with the lord but it's nice to just go and you know hear the word as the pastor preaches the word and every time get recharged uh, experience the work of the Holy Spirit in us and you know, come back. But I just think about the pastor. Every Sunday, if this person is preaching, how, like, who is preaching to them? Don't they want some time uh, where they want to sit and listen? Wouldn't it be tiring, uh, you know, to be engaged in this kind of a labor? But now, on the other side, as God has taken me through my journey and me being a pastor, you know, uh, several, in fact, before COVID, just before COVID, uh, when I was ministering one day, I thought to myself, you know, it's been so many Sundays, every Sunday, you know, uh, you know standing and sharing God's word. Uh, and of course, here at APC, we, we have a, like a common message most of the time. Sometimes it's, you know, my message that I preach, but still, you know, ministering uh, over there. But I don't feel tired. I feel energized. I feel, you know, like it, it's like you want to see the people being discipled in God's word. You want to see the work of the Holy Spirit as you speak the word of God, right? So these things motivate you. And, and you know, the church must grow. The people must mature. And I think to myself, you know, these intentions that God gives us, isn't that love that the pastor has for his congregation so what does that love make you do it causes you to labor in a way so to show that pastor loves uh, the congregation it's not always you know oh you are so nice you people are so good the pastor may not say that but you see it in the labor right 
and in any context i'm just giving you an example so you know loving in that way living a life of love in every context maybe in the family you find uh, husbands and wives uh, serving the home building up the home parents teaching their children so you know, earning for them uh, equipping them for life what is all that it's the love of god right as relating to brothers and sisters helping them in their time of need speaking a word of encouragement for them uh, teaching them god's word or oh, they don't know okay they, they have a question about baptism okay i'll tell you whatever i know so what are you doing you're imparting into the life of a brother and a sister to help them grow so these are all the demonstrations of love and love looks like all of this okay uh, so that is what god expects from us that we be like him in this world now jesus whatever he did i'm sure the outworking was because of the love that he had carried the way the father had the love for the people for mankind okay so as he is his nature his example his service his ministry so we are in this world you know our nature our example our ministry our labor today we are here on the earth and we must be the right representatives of who god is and finally describing the nature of god's love we are also told there is no fear in love but perfect love okay complete love casts out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love so uh, you know this one verse here it has so much depth to it just receiving the love of god and us being perfected in that love right uh, it will cast away all fear from us okay so what should we do as god's people yes we want to love others uh, we want to demonstrate god's love to others but we must first receive you know this is the principle of the kingdom of god first we receive i'm filled with the baptism in the holy spirit right i'm filled with the holy spirit of god then what can i do i can release the work of the spirit i receive the word of god i receive the revelation of the word of god i release the revelation of the word of god now we are being told the love of god you must you ought to love one another but how perfect love be made complete in love let us receive let me receive the love of god and that cures me spirit soul and body and as i understand oh, how much god loves me this is the way god loved me therefore i know how to love the people that he has put in my life people that he has given uh, you know in, in the ministry the people that i am supposed to build up so i must receive that love and when that love is being perfected perfect love casts out all fear so there is no fear involved in it it's very secure it's stable it is steadfast it is firm right uh, and, and you know it, it it is it is a love that brings assurance brings confidence okay and that's the god kind of love and there is no torment uh, involved in it and he continues on the same theme and he says we love him because he first loved us i already explained that to us it is he who has initiated and we as his people you know this goes more in the context of jesus being the groom and us being the bride and what is happening you know our love is a response to his love for us we love because he first loved us and again you know in the context of living out this love john is saying if somebody says i love god and he hates his brother he's a liar or he who does not love his brother who uh, does not does not love his brother whom he has seen how can he love god whom he has not seen this commandment we have from him that he who loves god must love his brother also so he's you know happening on the same 
a string here and he says, look, if this love of God is going to be perfect in us, then we will surely love our brothers and sisters. If we don't love our brothers and sisters, actually God's love has not been made perfect in us. So we must receive that. You know, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right? So something within me, whatever has happened within me, I'm only able to release that much. And in this case, now God's love has been perfected in me. If I have received God's love, then I'm able to give it out. But if I'm not giving it out, then he's sort of rebuking towards the end and he's saying, look, if you say I love God and you don't love your brother, you're a liar. Okay? And he says, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So everything must translate into actions, behavior, you know, patterns of thinking, lifestyle. Okay, and uh, the love of God, we on one hand, we understand, we rejoice, oh wow, how God loves us. But if you really understood it, if you really received it, we will live it out. We will give it out to others in our lives. So uh, even that is what we have seen today. Uh, I just want to pause at this time uh, to you know, probably hear from you uh, what you are thinking, if there's anything additional you want to kind of uh, uh, put across to what we've been discussing. So yeah, just feel free. Any thoughts you want to share? Any questions? It's, it's quite practical, isn't it? I hope it's not all up in the air, you know, God's love, or oh, how to receive that love, how to give that love. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so it's quite clear. That's good. Yeah. So, uh, class, I know that uh, you know we we are trying to finish this uh, quickly, but I believe the theme of the love of God, understanding God's love, uh, and you know, perfect love casts all casts out all fear. Letting that love minister to us. Right, and getting our boldness from that love. It's it's a course of a lifetime. And uh, you can't really like just cover it and close it in, in two hours. Uh, so I pray that whatever we have discussed today, that it is a start or a continuation to what you already know about God's love and never complete this course on. God's love. We may close off 1 John and move on to 2 John, but please never close off understanding God's love because our loving of God's people flows from there. Right? And uh, I told you that, that you know it's it's so powerful. Like even in psychology, you know, people say who we think we are and you know how we love ourselves. It really depends on how much of God's love his acceptance we have received and that makes us healthy as individuals and we are able to give out God's love to others so yeah I just pray for that revelation for all of us to be strengthened and established in it okay so let's close let's close with a word of prayer Akiran would you like to pray and close please yes ma'am Father God, we just come before your throne, Father God, once again. Once again, thanking you, Father God, for your love, for 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 your agape love, Father God, for your begotten Son, Father God. Father God, we used to do mistake and everything, Father God, and still your love is there, Father God. You used to forgive us, Father God, and please to right away, Father God. So we want to just say thank you, Father God. Father God, thanking you, Father God, for your love and that your Holy Spirit, Father God, who always helping 
ask Father God to every side, every step, Father God, and moving forward to um, coming journey, uh, journey your kingdom way, Father God. Thanking you, Father God. Thanking you to everything, Father God. Thanking you to ma'am and thanking you to all his students, Father God. Nicely, we are learning, Father God, to you. Every words, Father God, and thanking you, Holy Spirit, and thanking you, Father God, your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, thanking you, everything. Father God, bless us to do your kingdom work, Father God, to practically, Father God, when we go in front of earthly people and earthly way, Father God, and help us to uh, share that Father love, Father, to between them, Father God. Sometimes it's difficult, Father God, to help us and uh, help us to understand and share that love, Father, to other, Father God. Thanking you for your wisdom and knowledge, Father God. Upcoming time, I'm just submitting to your hand, Father God. You just take care of every sight, every moment, Father God. Thanking you. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everybody. Please feel free to log off. I know you have another class to catch. I'll see you again in the uh, class for Acts. God bless. Bye. Bye for now.